dedicated to Henry Farman. In the years of the primal war, from the dawn of terrestrial birth, man mastered the mammoth and horse, and man was the lord of the earth. Black is the night, metal we fight, power amp set to explode. Energy screams, magic and dreams, Satan records their first note. We chime the bell, chaos and hell, metal for maniacs pure. Faster than steel, fortune on wheels, brain hemorrhage is the cure for black metal. What is this episode of Agitators Anonymous about? Well, it's about black metal, and why not? And why not indeed? I'm Alan Averill. Your hostess with the leastest. This is episode 150 something. Who knows? Who can tell? Um, there are two options for this podcast. One, I was going to talk about um, Elon's rocket and cognitive dissonance. And then I thought about it and went, well, you know what? We've all had a tough week. Maybe on Friday we need to kick back and discuss um, the politics of black metal. Because oddly enough, it's been 30 years since 1993. 30 years and having been there at the time, in the midst of it, I thought it might be kind of cool to look back on those 30 years um, at the year 1993 to the albums that were released in that year, how it was a sort of pivotal year for black metal and arguably was never quite the same again. It was a sort of culmination of a couple of years leading up to that. What led to that, how I look back on it, Primordial contributed um I guess in the middle of that year with the demo of Dark Romanticism, I think we recorded it. Well, we are in April now. It was, I think, June, early June 1993. Um, so we contributed in our own way in the, I suppose it was a litany of demos that came out in that year. Maybe, as I said before in the podcast, missed some kind of a boat. I'm not sure where that boat was leading or where it was going. But we were in discussions at the time, I think, with... Um, what was it, Blackened, which was the sort of black metal arm of Plastic Head, about making the demo into a 12-inch, about remastering it, about obviously giving it better art than it was. I still look at the demo cover right now. I'm looking at it right at this moment, and I think to myself, why didn't we put the logo on the front of it? Instead, it's a, just a terrible type font logo. I think the um, little image on the cover is cool. I think it was um, a photo I took from the paper of a woman... Um, a hooded kind of woman connected to the Balkan Wars, tending to the grave of her child. Um, but why did I call the demo Dark Romanticism? Uh, who knows? Who knows? Um, my quiz master assistant, you may have seen us working together seamlessly at Beyond the Gates last year, Eric from Vautain, when he wants to uh, irritate me and annoy me, very often just goes, Dark Romanticism. Why? just says it like that. And he's quite right. Why did we call it dark romanticism? There was plenty of other reasons why we didn't or didn't have to call our demo that. Who knows what was going through my 18-year-old head at the time? Well, I'm going to try through the next whatever we get to, 30, 40, 50 minutes, discuss what exactly was going through my head. And not just my head, but our heads. Because black metal was this, um, a cultural zeitgeist, a phenomenon at the time that... Um, was pre-internet, and I think think that's something to um, really get wrap your head around now for people who've obviously, well, are not quite as old or who weren't there in 1993, that it was a kind of organic cultural zeitgeist movement that was really spread through letter writing. Now, there is this perception, I suppose, from the late 70s and early 80s. I was just discussing this today um, on my Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash Alan Averill, by the way, about New Wave of British Heavy Metal and how that the common conception or perception is that um, the DIY ethic of punk, which of course existed, not necessarily 1977 or whatever, the same way. Um, the common perception is that the DIY ethic um, of punk didn't exist in New Wave of British Heavy Metal, but this is vastly untrue. If you look at the actual number of seven inches released by New Wave of British Heavy Metal bands across the UK, I would say, I would put a very big bet on the fact that it's um, hugely outnumbered the m amount of independent punk seven inches. Punk was more of a middle class art student concern. And I think New British Heavy Metal was the working class music of the time. Not all of it, of course. And then we talk before we get to Discharge in 81 and that uh, um, the, the, you know, as sort of punk went back into... I suppose DIY and political ethics that the 1977-78 punk really wasn't about that at all. However, anyway, I'm getting sidetracked, of course, but that's why you listen to Ag Agitators Anonymous for a little peek under the hood of my adult brain. 
the point I'm trying to make is that there was always this DIY ethic um, within heavy metal of making your own seven inches, making your own demos. Then as with everything, it gets co-opted by the mainstream somewhere around 83, 84. This happened to heavy metal, of course. The success of Def Leppard, the success of Iron Maiden um, in 82 and 83, everyone was out looking for those next bands. So you had bands like Samson, Diamond Head, Angel Witch getting big deals. It's the same thing happened in black metal. By, by 1995, 1996, Black metal had become Duma Borger and Cradle of Filth, and it had become, you know, huge, hundred thousand, couple of hundred thousand selling records, and it had become on the cover of every magazine. It, it, it kind of, of course, it pissed off. It naturally pissed off all the people who were grassroots underground people. That's just how things go. I remember once upon a time I had a ticket to go and see Nirvana way before they were famous, somewhere I think in '89, I think or something. Um, it could have, it could have even been Nirvana and Sonic Youth. And then they returned to Dublin to play in like a 400 venue and I had a ticket. It was only four pounds. Um, no big deal, just four quid. And they cancelled. Anyway, and the opprobrium that was dealt to um, Nirvana by Nirvana fans, my sister being one of those who um, didn't want them to break into the mainstream. I suppose this is naturally always the way um, with young people. As I remember at the time myself, where black metal went in 1996 was not where we I wanted black metal to go. And it was one of the reasons why we had left death metal behind. But I'm going to get into it. I'm going to get into it. Anyway, the podcast is sponsored by Metal Blade Records. Follow the links under low in the description. Um, somebody uh, earlier on was messaging me looking for uh, primordial t-shirts and that kind of thing. We don't really stock much online merchandise. I've talked about it before. The overheads of doing so, of printing it somewhere else, um, sending it to us, storing it, uh, buying packaging to post it out, the postal costs, which are insane from Ireland, and then, um, you know, all the rest of the kind of thing leaves a profit margin that, to be honest, is um, not really comparable to buying a T-shirt over um, a merch stall at a gig. So, invariably, that profit is divided by five before tax, etc., etc. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but those are the reasons why um, that and innate laziness, I suppose, why we don't have a huge big merch store. Anyway, what am I talking about? If you want to buy a primordial t-shirt amongst Cannibal Corpse, Merciful Fate, loads of other killer bands, um, go to med, um, IndieMerch.com slash MetalBlade Records and use the promo code AA2023. Um, you can follow the links in the description. Also, if you're looking for a backdrop for your band, hit me up in the DMs and I will refer you uh, to the best people that I know who make backdrops. And there you will get a pretty good discount, to say the least. So 1993 was 30 years ago, obviously. And um, it doesn't really, of course, it doesn't feel like uh, 30 years ago, but then time never really does, does it? It feels like another, it definitely feels like another era. One of the first things you have to compartmentalize or really understand about 1993, of course, if, you've, if you're have if you considerably younger, is the idea that um, we grew up in this, around this movement within the underground without the internet. Um, it wasn't easy to check out and find out bands. We were all writing letters. There were days when... Um, I suppose I started to trade some black metal demos. You first started to notice something was a bit different in the end of 88, 89. Maybe 89, you began to get things like Rotten Christ, Satanus, Tedium. I remember getting a cassette with Masters Hammer, Hammer The Mass. Um, you know, Sarcophago, I know I was a couple of years before that, but you were, there was some male medieval prophecy. There was m movers and shakers. It, there was things happening in the air, uh, Russell in the hedgerow, whatever you want to say, um, that was separating things a bit from black and death metal. Now, of course, originally, there was, I think, realistically, no difference between black and death metal, so to speak. I mean, you could call Alters of Madness has uh, elements of black metal to it. It even says so in the thanks list. Um, and possess seven churches. Of course, maybe not with something like Scream Bloody Gore. I could I could see that's just pure death metal. But there were, al there were albums that kind of straddled both um, both elements. More abominations of desolation is a great um, example. But there was there was rumblings. There was bands within the underground who were moving away from the concept of death metal, and they were beginning to kind of introduce back studs and nails and leather and this sort of venom look from eighty one and eighty two or Hellhammer and that kind of thing. Um, and they stood out like a sore thumb. The ten or fifteen bands in eighty nine from around the world who are not following the usual trends. We're yet to get to the sort of Morris Sound um, or Sunlight Studio Stockholm uh, elements of the whole scene where oh, most of the death metal was funneled. But by 1991, 1992, the first sort of black metal albums have come out, Worship Him, 
I think was a really pivotal moment. Then a blaze in the northern sky really set set things up for change. You have live in Leipzig, um, passage to Arcturo. There's the Varathron demo, the split with Necromantia. Um, there's Behera at seven inches. There's lots of things happening, but there's there's definitely a fundamental shift. And what was kind of happening, I think, was that an awful lot of people, and I include myself in this, were so immersed now in the underground and looking for the most obscure stuff, who really believed that um, black metal was a sort of antidote to where um, death metal was going. The death metal and black metal used to be pretty similar. And then death metal sort of, I guess, was heading towards MTV, was moving away from um, the vile, filthy, evil, you know, satanic, whatever you want to call it, dark subject matter and moving into more eco-environmental stuff. And that was just a sort of moral death knell for the people who wanted metal to be hauled back to 1981 and 82 and be ugly. And part of that is that thing that I said, that sort of, well, you know, this is not really for you kind of thing. Um, I remember tape trading with people and you'd have some Somebody who was just kind of, I guess, just into mainstream heavy metal who'd heard a name and went, oh, a lot of it was because of that Kerrang! article in 93, which mentioned bands like Pro Fanatica and Rotting Christ and Samael. Um, and it was the sort of one, the Kerrang! episode with Varg on the cover. And that's what really sort of broke the whole story of black metal out into the mainstream. At the time, Kerrang! I think was the biggest selling music periodical in the world, which was a couple of hundred thousand copies, if I'm not incorrect. And in the back of that magazine, it sort of had a list of um, black metal albums, a curious list that was a bit imprecise, but it did contain lots and lots of names. And I remember in 1993, the amount of people who then came up to me in school, because we I used to have a big tape trading list. And then there was the secret list, a bit like Motorhead's Secret Rider, if you know what I mean. Um, and there was, I, there was my secret sort of tape trading list that wasn't for the normies. I'm doing, I'm doing parentheses here now, or rabbit ears, or whatever you call them. Although somebody complained to me and said, they're not parentheses. Well, whatever they are. Um, I'm doing that right now. But um, just imagine it in your head, me standing, looming over you, doing rabbit ears. Anyway, so it mentioned all these names, and then people would come up to me with cassette tapes in school, knowing I was Mr. Black Metal, and go, can you tape me Varathron, um, the, you know, His Majesty of the Swamp? And I'd say, no, it's not meant for you. <laughs> I mean, total dickhead move, but being a dickhead was sort of part of Black Metal also. I remember LG, LG from Entombed, rest in power, Mr. Lars Goran Petrov, but he told me a funny story about um, a kind of... Uh, a barbecue, like a summer barbecue or something in 1990, maybe, um, you know, with all the Swedish and Norwegian death metal heads. Maybe it was 1991 and they all got together and got drunk and played football and jumped around and all this kind of stuff at somebody's house. And then within one year, um, the whole tone was different when they'd met and everybody had dyed black hair and was, um, you know, the fringe in front of their face and everybody was wearing Venom and Hellhammer shirts. And this was, I could probably include myself within that as well. Although, from my side, the identification with bands like Sabbat especially was a big influence. Um, Hellhammer, Celtic Frost, Merciful Fate, Bathory, Venom. Really, <clears throat> for me, that was sort of... I would always was always into those bands much more than the jeans and t-shirt bands. Like Bathory in 88 was my band, not Nuclear Assault or Testament. I wasn't always, I was always drawn to the more theatrical, whatever you want to say, the more dramatic. And so those bands were totally in my wheelhouse already. And it may sound strange to people, but Merciful Fate was not popular in 1991, 1992. Um, the black metal bands at the time who were getting some press were talking again about Venom, Hellhammer, um, Celtic Frost. But you also have to understand those vinyls hadn't been repressed. A lot of the noise records from 1985 and 86, they were hard to get. If you found a copy of Hellhammer Apocalyptic Grades, I mean, this was a bonanza. Um, I remember stealing uh, one from a shop somewhere in about 1990 and giving it to Dara from Invictus. It was only one pound um, and they'd left the record in the sleeve. And I just thought, how can I not steal this? Um, it's, I think, one of the only things I've ever stolen. There you go. Anyway, Dara has it. So he has... A, profited from my uh, profligate ways. Actually, profligate is the wrong word there. I just felt like saying it. It sort of sounded good. A uh, profit of profligation. Yes, you can have that. That can be the name of your um, black metal band. Anyway, what am I talking about? There was definitely a sense, um, a kind of like the way death metal sort of knocked thrash on the head at the end of 90. And thrash sort of 
ceased to be the most extreme thing, ceased to be the most exciting thing. Um, and death metal was it. By 1992, rumblings had begun and a lot of people were moving away to black metal because death metal had become, again, all the same Morrisound sound um, tone. Um, Sunlight Studios had begun belching out bands as well. And I guess people were just a little bit bored. Scenes move very, very quickly pre-internet. Um, now, of course, you know, 1993, 30 years ago. But the difference between 1991 and 1990 in tape trading terms in 1993 was um, huge. By 1990, early 1993, black metal was literally the exciting thing. And it felt like death metal had sort of worn out its welcome. I think Covenant came out in 93, which is one of the only death metal albums in 93 that absolutely just kicked our ass. Maybe Once Upon the Cross as well. But by and large, at this time, an awful lot of us um, who were always kind of drawn to this more theatrical, um, you know, dramatic side, um, had kind of just got fed up with death metal, um, which is bizarre when you think about it, because realistically, when you're looking from the outside, looking in, you're sort of really splitting hairs when you're talking about the difference in those things. I mean, listen to the version of Angel of Disease on Covenant and tell me that's not black metal, right? But there was definitely a feeling that it was a sort of anti-death metal feeling at the time. That death metal had gone far too far down the path of Napalm Death lyrics, far too punk influenced, become sort of eco stuff, um, environmental death metal. It was on MTV, members were wearing shorts and bright coloured hats. And there was just a sort of reaction to that. There always is. Every action has a reaction. And the reaction within the black metal underground was to go, no, fuck you, black metal is supposed to be ugly. It's supposed to be swords and leather and studs and nails and Satan and orthodoxy. And I'm quite, I, I did an interview with a guy, um, I can't remember the name of the podcast, about a month ago, and we talked a little bit about black metal because I've just made this Verminous Serpent album um, with the guys from Malthusian and Slitter. And um, that was an album that I could have made in 1991, as in I put, I, I put the same sort of um, energy into it as I had in 1991 and my feelings about black metal have not changed they have not moved one single inch since 1991 or 1992 it's either orthodoxy or nothing um, you can preface your two words black metal with whatever you want you can have anarcho black metal you can have feminist black metal you can have pagan black metal you can preface it with what you want but it is not black metal not in the orthodox sense and I'm quite proud of the fact that my knuckle-dragging um, anti-intellectual stance has not changed in 30 years. It is not meant to progress and it's not meant for us to comment on it such as so. And that may sound ridiculous coming from a middle-aged man, but I don't care. The podcast is called Agitators Anonymous. What do you want from me? Black metal does not change. It does not evolve. It does not go anywhere. And if you think it should do, then you, in my opinion, have misunderstood it. I once did a lecture about black metal, actually. It's a long time ago, but in Maynooth College, which is a sort of fundamentally religious college in the center, not quite the center of Ireland, but about an hour and a half from Dublin. I was invited to do one, and about 50 people showed up. Now, of course, now it will be filmed and cut up, and there'll be somebody complaining about what I said. But I opened that lecture with the words, you cannot intellectualize a punch in the face. Um, which I'd sort of, you know, butchered from some other somebody else. But the principle was that black metal at the time was this cultural zeitgeist movement, and it was based on a kind of primal raw aggression and, and a, a willingness to adopt the most extreme elements, the most extreme symbolism. Did not necessarily mean there was um, a belief behind it. I mean, how many of the bands at the time were actual Satanists? Um, probably not many. But I sense that that's sort of missing the point because it was about the sort of honesty of energy, the um, sort of um, the passion that went behind it that came from an honest place. And even if that honest place, you might have had misgivings about uh, whether somebody genuinely meant it or not. I suppose that was a difference. You just called something true black metal. But the orthodoxy of it uh, meant the black metal had to occupy this space that was... Um, you know, arcane, occult, satanic, whatever you want to call it, um, obsessed with the dark side um, of life, to put it plainly and simply. And if it did not have that sort of honest obsession, then it ceased to be black metal. 
And to clear something up, I mean, and I said this in 1992 and 1993, is that black metal has no sound other than it's metal. Merciful Fate is black metal. Venom is black metal. They have an album called Black Metal. To argue contrary is just kind of pedantic semantics, to be honest with you. Um, you know, Mortu Drape doesn't sound like Mystifier, doesn't sound like Blast for me, doesn't sound like Bastille Warlust, doesn't sound like Dark Throne. It doesn't sound like Immortal. They all sound different because there was no strict structure to it. It just became a thing that people said that, oh, if it doesn't sound like this cold northern style of black metal, then it isn't black metal. But this is, of course, patently untrue. And most of that you can just trace back to that cover of Kerrang! in 1993. I'm aware that the argument is full of intellectual inconsistencies. But that's also part of the point. In 1993, it was, you were, you know, young and dumb and full of, well, you know what, and had this relentless, reckless, wild energy. And it, it was obsessive. You were obsessed by black metal. And um, that's where the sort of honesty of intent came from. Now, did we at the time get into the sort of biblical inconsistencies of whether we we're talking about Satan as a metaphor? And um, some people took it as a sort of Luciferian ideal, the sort of rebel in man, which was more what I kind of sided with, that it was a symbolic identification with this sort of um, rebellious side of man, the artistic side of man, the uh, side of man that went against the grain on a very, very broad level. Then there were, of course, people who took it as a very sort of primeval um, sort of almost medieval devil worship who believed in a corporeal figure of the devil that represented evil. And that's what they were siding with. I mean, there was it was a broad church, the church of, well, the church of Satan, uh, pun intended, because there were people in the black metal scene who were committed to the church of Satan, such as Acheron and bands like this. And then, of course, you had the Death Like Silence, Euronymous's label, which had the sort of crossed out figure of Anton LaVey, um, at the bottom right of its CDs, I think, if I'm not incorrect. And also, a few, a few of them had, like, crossed out... Um, what's his name? Scott Burns, Morrison, which seemed to be rather odd to me anyway. Which seemed to me to be a bit, little bit ridiculous. But anyway, um, as an older gentleman, I can um, see the intellectual inconsistencies of um, some of the application of what we consider to be the tenets, the orthodoxy, the rules of black metal. But that's part of any cultural zeitgeist of movement. It's part of the charm. It's also part of being young. And it's also part of art, the idea that you can have contradictions. Um, it's a bit more difficult to explain now as everybody is so precise at wanting a binary answer of what is wrong, what is right, what is, you know, which side of the fence that you fall and all that kind of thing. But... This was the beauty. This is the beauty of being involved in the tape trading scene in the underground at the time in black metal because it was crackling with life. It seemed like a really genuine, rebellious countercultural movement. And when you were so obsessed with it and so involved in it, um, this is exactly what inspired you. And it was the in honesty of intent that um, was the true inspiration. Anyway, what am I talking about? I'm talking about black metal. And you, of course, have the freedom to disagree if you wish to. You have the freedom to disagree vehemently if you wish. That's up to you. That's called freedom of, well, whatever you want to call it. So let's just take a look at some of the black metal albums that were released in the year of 1993 um, and just assess their impact and that kind of thing at the time. There are obviously going to be some that I've missed out and you can hit me up in the comments and say, yeah, you forgot the fucking blah, 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 whatever demo. Well, let's start with a big one, and it's Under Funeral Moon by Dark Throne. Now, Dark Throne, of course, had started as more sort of techno, thrash, death metal. Um, Soulside Journey was a curious record. I remember it came out in the shop here the same day as Malevolent Creation, the Ten Commandments. And listening to both, I chose to buy Malevolent Creation, Ten Commandments. I still think that's a pretty good choice. Soulside Journey sort of, um, now I appreciate more than at the time. It's a very cold, dark record that doesn't that isn't that removed really from some of where Dark Throne went. Strange record, strange record, but it's very, it's it just doesn't kind of crackle with life. And then A Blazing Northern Sky is the huge one, for me at least, that with huge big drum sound, massive bass tone. And when you heard Ashen the Shadow of the Horns for the first time, it literally was, um, it had a massive impact. I remember getting a cassette from Peaceville. You had to enter some competition or send off something to Peaceville and you got this free cassette and just, I remember calling some friends up and going, fucking hell, under the sign of the black mark is back. Um, and we'd been waiting 
for that. So Under Fuel and Moon is the record after, and this is the one with such a what I would call cruel and cold production. It's before Dark Throne decided they were working class and they were punk, so they were going hiking or any of this kind of stuff. And it's not to say that those albums don't have their charm. I'm quite a fan of Circle the Wagons and um, the Cult is Alive is a, a strong record as well. But this was something really, really special and the iconic artwork um, and you've got songs like Unholy Black Metal and um, To Walk the Infernal Fields. It's a, an absolute classic and a total game changer. Um, what else have we got in 93? We've got The Somber Lane by, Di- by Dissection, which some people say is death metal, but I would kind of disagree because The Somber Lane is a sort of a, the mixture of Merciful Fate. It's got Bathory um, and it's got some Morbid Angel and that kind of thing. But this, this the guitar playing, all this kind of stuff, when you, when you realise that they were in their teens, I think 17, 18, 19 years old making the Sombre Lane. Um, it's, and it's got the early Dan Swano production, which, although a little bit flawed, is still great. Very big snare sound. Um, uh, Dan did a really great interview on, um, I can't remember the name of the magazine, but it was all about those early, had loads of cool photos of Edge of Sanity and loads of cool stuff about the studio at the time um, and his recording methods and making the best of I think like 16 analog tracks and stuff but the Sombre Lane by Dissection is just a towering record one of the greatest uh, black let's call it black death metal I suppose uh, Impel Nazarene Ogre Karma I'm a big big Impel Nazarene fan in fact the um, the first demo The Oath of the Goat Tiao Get Fo Hato Et was one of my most played demos of the time and I remember there was a live um, I think a live show tagged onto it which actually came out as a bootleg vinyl a split with Beherit which I have somewhere um, and this had the insane rawr, 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 kind of song intros and of course becoming friends with them and playing with them over the years adds to the um, hilarity of uh, you know being a friend of uh, Mikaz but this was a, a brutal record at the time the the opening song I can't remember what it's called it was just hit you like a tr- fucking truck march going down a hill and there was of course this sort of what would have now been called a fabricated uh, war between the Finns and the Norwegians but at the time who really knew what that was about um, Tolcom Snorts Snorts Snores is a very very strange record the one before this um, absolutely brilliant record I think and if you add in the Goat Perversion 7 inch and the um, Sado Goat I think it's called Seven Inches. Impel Nazarene back then was kind of untouchable. They were mixing also some, um, beginning to mix, I think, Latex Cult afterwards, the album afterwards, some great sort of Discharge, GBH, Venom, kind of Angel Dust style um, black and roll sort of elements. Um, three three huge albums out of the gate. Satyricon, Dark Medieval Times, um, brilliant record. I'm a bit more of a fan of The Shadow Throne. Dark Medieval Times is sort of, it's got this very um, cruel, harsh sound. And you could really have played that to somebody, even somebody who wasn't interested in metal at the time, and said, OK, listen to this, um, Dark Medieval Times. And you can hear the difference between this and Malevolent Creation, right? Because to some people, that's just, you know, heavy metal nerds splitting airs. Airs? Hairs. Um, but you you can hear this is this is coming from a different place. Um, Dark Medieval Times. I, I think the artwork, although kind of cute, is, is was a bit naff, but, you know, well, okay. But Dark Medieval Times, Satyricon, and they've just been re-released, I think, those records now, and they're they, they're um, being treated nicely. I didn't... They were hard to get on vinyl back then at the time. However, anyway, Dark Medieval Times, absolute classic. I mean, when we just look where we go now, Burzum, Detsam and Gangvar. Detsam and Gangvar is odd, because I, I had an advanced cassette of this um, a year, at least a year before it came out. I had it before... Um, I even heard some of the albums after it, which doesn't make any sense. But I think Varg recorded it um, before. Um, oh, who knows? I certainly don't know. Anyway, it's it's got this is an especially cruel, harsh, dark sounding record. Um, the artwork I find less goofy than um, Dark Medieval Times, but it's obviously got it's still mired in this um, Lord of the Rings style um, imagery, but. Because I think Det Som Meng Gangvar, does that not mean one ring to rule them or something? I don't know. Probably not, and you're going to hit me up in the comments and shout at me. But an utterly brilliant record, super cold and dark, and you're getting this. What's one of the things that that awful Lords of Chaos movie never really got to the hub of or the got to explaining that despite what you may think about the um, the age of the people involved in that, the, all the murders and all that kind of thing and in that movie, um, it kind of portrayed them as goofy teenagers, which, I mean, look, all teenagers are goofy. 
but it never quite also said, but by the way, they did back this up with some of the most incredible music that still sounds um, still sounds amazing and holds up. Pure Holocaust by Immortal, 1993. Now, the thing about Pure Holocaust is <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that the tape was sped up, um, that they just changed the tempo on the album a little bit. You know what I mean when you listen to it now. There's something not quite right about the pitch of the snare drum, um, and it does sound like it was sped up. Um, I think I think I know that for a fact. Um, anyway, it doesn't spoil my enjoyment of the record. I still think it's an absolutely brilliant record. But anyway, yeah, 1993, Norway hitting out of the park. Marduk, those of the unlight. Um, this is, I think, um, I mean, I'm a huge fan of the um, the newer Marduk as well, I think. Um, Romans 5.12, I'm not just saying that because I sing on on Accuser of Poser, but I think it's a... Uh, I think that's a brilliant record. I, I'm I'm a big fan of Serpent Sermon. I'm a big fan of all the new stuff. There's a there's a, a fundamentally darker element to it. But if you go back in time, um, and just sort of before we get to the Panzer Division Mark Marduk album, the classic album, Those of the Unlight. I mean, this has got wolves and you know on darkened wings on it. Great record and hysterical vocals. Really, really fucking extreme. Um, scorn. Defeat by Psy. Psy just released an album that went back a little bit to black metal and it's really, really good. But Score and Defeat, the, two, the seven inches in the demos before, I think, are just um, excellent. But you've got the Nell, Victory of Dakini. Um, and we played with Psy in 1994 a bit for this album. Um, they were everywhere back then. Brilliant, brilliant record. I think you can put in Catatonia Dance of the December Souls maybe in there. It's sort of like Black Doom. Certainly um, for the demos, the guys were wearing corpse paint and, you know, grotesque shirts and all this kind of thing. Um, and Dance of the December Souls, I think you can put in. It's another, it's got that same, that Dan Swano, big, big snare sound, and um, which you, slightly bigger than on the Sumberlane, but still I think you can count in the canon. Never Again by Belial. Um I'm a big Belial Wisdom of Darkness fan in the 7-inch. Never again, for some reason, um, I didn't like at the time, and I don't know why, but I've got to go back and listen to it again. Ungod, Circle of the Seven Infernal Pacts. Yeah, I used to write to Shrike on, Shrike on. This is a good record. Really early German black metal, 93. Unholy Union, Christ Agony. Christ Agony, an underrated band you should check out from Poland. In the Shadows of Merciful Fate. Okay, In the Shadows of Merciful Fate. <laughs> I mean... Um, yeah, this is a fucking brilliant record. I've done this before in the podcast, but those 90s Merciful records are great. Goetia by Mystifier. Early Osmos. Osmos Productions from France just kind of had everything back at the time. They were killing it, killing it. They had all the biggest bands in black metal. Mystifier Goetia is great, kind of. It's got this sort of layer of a heat and dust and kind of sweat off it that's just... Um, really remarkable, kind of occult-sounding record. Really, really recommended Mystifier Guisha. They're still playing. You can go to go and see them. And Nocturnal Silence, Necrophobic. Yep, Necrophobic. Great band back then. Um, I'm a big fan of that. Thy Mighty Contract, Rod in Christ. Well, now here we're talking. I remember getting a few, two songs off this from Sarkis on a cassette in the end of 93. And they just fucking blew my mind. I transform all suffering into plague and sign of evil existence. I remember playing that cassette over and over and over and over again. The Mighty Contract, I will take over um, any Norwegian black metal album of this year. It's just, you know, it's just um, one of my faves of the entire um, scene I, at the time. Um, now, of course, you can say, well, there's a drum machine, there's this theater. Well, the drum machine is really non serviam what I understand is that the Mighty Contract is an electronic drum kit, which was then quantized a bit. Some of it does sound a bit unnatural, um, as His Majesty of the Swamp by Varathron is a drum machine at the time. But for some reason, I just let it go. I let it go. Faustian Dawn, Dumoncy. Yeah, it's a good record. In the Glare of Burning Churches, Graveland demo. Yeah, this is a harsh, harsh, harsh lesson, this demo. Very extreme. Aguilera by Hades. A, um, I think the list I'm go I'm looking at here is on lycanthropia.net. Very cool list, by the way, Lycanthropia, wherever this website is from. Aguilera by Hades, yeah, from Peru. Great band. There was so much good stuff happening in South America at this time. Stillbirth Machine, Order from Chaos, along with Rod in Christ and Under a Funeral Moon, maybe my favorite record of this year. Order from Chaos is just um, one of my very, very favorite bands. This is 
an American take on black and white, but the tone is so harsh and so extreme. And it's you can hear where Revenge took some stuff from where war metal kind of um is it a war metal record? It could be. Is it black metal record? Could be. Helmkamp's voice is imperious. Um, absolutely one of the greatest records of this time. Ulver Vargnat. I never really got into Ulver. Um, I'm just going through the list now. Um, Journey through the cold moors of Svartian, Carpathian Forest. Uh, this was the demo. Um, I think they had the um, Bloodlust and Perversion demo was before this. And uh, cold moors of Svartian was a sort of more atmospheric kind of strangely instrumental tracks. I'm not instrumental. I'm not sure how to describe them. They appear on the Titan Caves, Chasm Woods EP. Um, Emperor, Emperor EP. I mean, this is huge. I remember getting an advance cassette of this from Faust somewhere um, in the end of 92, maybe early 93. And it just blew our minds. I mean, I brought it into the promoter rehearsal. We were writing songs for our demo and it was just like, listen to this. This is fucking insane. Um, yeah, it, it was a game changer, absolute game changer. And of course, it's paired with Enslaved, Hordain's Land EP, my favourite thing Enslaved did. Um, much respect to both of those bands of gentlemen. But Emperor, Emperor, and of course it has the infamous Gustav Dory art, the whole thing, the aesthetic just um, is perfect. Ildjarn, Nihog, Norse, split seven inch. This is a cool thing. Ildjarn was a kind of cool, underrated a band, very, very simplistic, monotonal black metal that I think um, aged really, really well. It's worth going back and finding the Ildiarn stuff. Disembodied by Sabat from Japan. I mean, they, Sabat stuff had been going since the mid 80s. Very hard to get. Finding a copy of Disembody was very difficult. I saw Sabat in 2000 and was left a little bit nonplussed by um, their live show with the little babies' heads and stuff. and or not babies' heads, dolls' heads, and they were all in their underwear, and I was like, mm, okay, okay. I stood there looking at, watching it with Ian from Destroyer 666 at the time, and he just looked at me and goes, this is fucking shit, mate, and walked off in disgust. <laughs> and we kind of, well, went, all right. Gods of War, Blasphemy. The Mighty Blasphemy released their second album, Gods of War, um, which I think unfairly is sort of dismissed by some Blasphemy fans now. I'm sure it ain't Fall Angel Doom, but it's not a bad record by any means. And um, I think if you get it now, it has the Blood on the Altar demo, which is an absolutely um, one of the best demos at all, um, of this whole period. Me and my couple of mates used to sit on the beach um, down near us and, you know, you had your... Um, Ross Bay cult or whatever you want to call it. We, we had our Sutton Bay, blah, blah, whatever, which is where we grew up. And we used to listen to have our little boom box, our little tape player and play cassettes and stuff. And Blood on the Altar was one of our favourite um, cider drinking beach records. Hordain's Land, In the Forest of the Dreaming Dead, Unanimated. This is a great record. I, th I think originally came out on... Fuck, who released this? This was uh, Necropolis Records. And um, it's got a couple of different covers, but it's a it's a great record. I think it's actually the best on animated record, in my opinion. Um, I once played on a football team with a member of Unanimated, if I'm not incorrect. But that's neither here nor there. Total fucking darkness, Cradle of Filth. Yeah, Cradle of Filth were beginning, if you heard the rehearsal demos beforehand, they're beginning to get their sound together. They're beginning to get the this sort of Victorian, Poe-esque sort of horror black metal together that was big, very English in its sort of outlook and I'm a, I'm a fan of The Principle of Evil Med Flesh and Total Fucking Darkness is a cool record yeah or a cool demo I wonder where my demo of it is Crossing the Fury Path Necromantia I mean come on Necromantia Crossing this is two bases um, the split album between Necromantia and Varathron is one of the most important records of this whole period I got this um Something like Christmas Eve 1992, I think, maybe, or could it? I'm not really too sure. <clears throat> but that was a huge defining moment. Necromantia, still going, contributed some comments to the new Necromantia book. But back then they were, they, again, this is what I mean by the difference in the tones and sounds of black metal. Necromantia sounded nothing like Dark Throne or Immortal. Beherit, Drawing Down the Moon. I mean, people, of course, everyone wears the Oath of Black Blood shirt and that kind of thing, but the album is drawing down the moon, make no mistake. This is um, one of the, like, it was an earth-shattering record at the time and still stands up to this day as one of the best black metal rec records of this period. I've so seen a flyer that Beherit is playing in Japan with Blasphemy. Could that really be true? One of the last time 
Beharit actually played a gig. Is it? it must be 1992 or three. Um, it's fucking crazy. Uh, the expectations people are going to have for that show. If um, they show up and whoever's playing in the band don't look like 1992 because their pictures and their images were so iconic. So iconic. Havo Hej, The Throne, The Son of God, another great record, killer vocals. And this was the kind of side band of Paul Ledney from Pro Fanatica. Artwork was fucking cool, if I remember. He's standing in a field. Um, yeah, I mean, this is this was a, a great record. Uh, I'm really qu- quite a fan of the monotony of Pro Fanatica. Appeal of Evil of Blasphemy, Abhor. Um, yeah, Singapore. I'm not sure did they what happened to that band, but this was a great EP. Sorcerer Written in Blood, Gorgoth demo. It's that's a killer demo. It's super killer demo. It's much more like Black Thrash. Damned Majesty Infernum from Poland. Um Strid, the end of life. Strid, this was an interesting seven inch, really worth exploring. I'm beginning to, you know, roll through the list because there's so many brilliant records. His Majesty of the Swamp, Varathron. I'm a huge Varathron fan. I was actually a bit disappointed with this record compared to Genesis of Apocryphal Desire partially because the drum machine was just a bit too obvious you've got the first Belfagor demo live in Leipzig of course um, came out in 1993 after a two year hiatus this is a great record it's, and what's interesting about it is it's so unedited you can hear all the conversations on the stage between the songs um, and Dead's voice sounds fucking really awesome Messe de Mort Barrett Split Aske Burzum do 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 Dude, or whatever the riff is. Yeah, I just keep doing that kind of thing. I forget I'm actually talking to people. Um, yeah, this is brilliant. This is one of the best EPs ever. Uh, Burzum Ask, it's absolutely great. Um, for, you know, whatever the controversies are, I don't really care about your opinion about it or about whatever the opinion about Varg, whatever, who cares? But Burzum Ask, a stone cold classic EP. And if you don't listen to it because of some political principle whatever that's your prerogative but you're missing out on a great EP 13 Candles um, oh there they are we're Dutch guys yeah um, you got demos from Abigail Abigor I mean the names keep on coming I'm just flicking through the list now we're into kind of demos Abarim Abruptum Absurd Accused Accused sorry Accursed yeah they were pretty good Akron Gates Agitus Agitus Demo uh, Agony, Algaon, who were everywhere for a while. They had a, 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 a mini CD that everybody had. Algal, Amon, yeah, yeah, from Switzerland. Anal Vomit, wow, yeah, Peru, cool band. Anatomy, Twisted Depths of Horrors, cool Australian band. Ancient Ceremony, yeah, they were everywhere. Actually, oddly enough, one of the very first um, open airs in Germany, I've talked about it before in the podcast, that was supposed to be happen. Um, we got money for that, and it was not enough. We got just like... N- n- notes in the post in an envelope uh, trying to bring us over and it was I think in flames dissection um, and the organiser of that was the guy from Ancient Ceremony I wonder what ever happened to them Ancient Wisdom Ancient um, the first Arch Goat EP Angel Cunt Tales of Desecration came out that was um, a brilliant EP it was again on Acropolis Records and I remember sending off for that at the time you've got Arcanum then following up I'm just looking through the names of some of the demos and even some of the demos coming out in this year are absolutely amazing. Um, Balsa Goth's demo. Wow, we played some gigs with Balsa Goth for their first album in the UK in 1994. Um, they were absolutely great at that time. Great live as well. Um, they were all swords and studs and leather. Um, very much kind of like an answer to Sabbat or something. Makes me want to go and listen to Balsa Goth again. And maybe um, the albums that I couldn't quite get into after that, Battle Magic, might mean a bit more to me now. Looking back, Barathrum from Finland. The first Behemoth demo, with The Return of the Nor- Northern Moon. I mean, I, I do admit that at the moment this is just me listing off um, names of um, demos. You know, Belketre, um, Belial. I mean, and we're only on B. <laughs> Black Crucifixion had an EP, Promethean Gift with a strange whispering singing. I used to be a really big fan of Black Crucifixion. I uh, used to write to uh, Timo, was it? And then we play together about 20 years after writing letters together. Still going and still a cool band, Black Crucifixion, actually. Carpathian Full Moon released um, an EP called Katie's Sacrilegia, which I think... I'm not sure when the last time I released I listened to that, but I used to listen to it quite a lot. I wonder if it um, deserves some reinvestigation. 
I think there was a split that I liked from Sweden, Chalice and Ilska. I think that was a cool uh, split release. Wow. I mean, there's just so many names here. Crucifier, um, who were great by disgrace of God. They, they were just everywhere at the time. Corpse and Molestation, who turned into Bestial Warlust, who then sort of turned into Destroyer 666. Um, there's just, there's so many uh, cool lists here. I'm not, I mean, we could be here for another 20 minutes, me just listing names of bands, but I'm not going to do that. Um, Dead Christ, wow, Satan's Hunger. Yeah, the UK had some cool... Um, some cool old uh, black death metal bands, Thus Defiled as well, Decayed from Portugal. Um, it's all taking me back here, um, to be honest with you, but I mean, I'm not just going to read out a list of names. You can go to lycanthropia.net and look at the list of albums, and I've probably missed out a couple of albums, but look at the list of records that came out that I've probably missed um, and assess them for yourselves. But it, what it represents is a complete cultural zeitgeist of a movement. So many people just energized, just moving at the same time in different countries to the sort of drums of this new, um, this new exciting, vibrant thing um, that was genuinely felt rebellious, and it was just kind of a fuck you to the mainstream of what metal had become, and that was black metal um and that my friends is sort of where i'm going to leave it we're at the 45 minute mark i realize a lot of people don't get this far if you've got this far i appreciate it um and i just thought it'd be interesting to go back and discuss black metal 30 years 30 years on and what's the legacy well i mean black metal is a cultural phenomenon that people have you know making mainstream movies about the, um, the the imagery the aesthetic is instantly recognizable even by people who've never even heard any of the albums that i've been talking about is that a good thing is that a bad thing it's hard to say it was probably an, an inevitability because what black metal also represented was church burnings there was deaths there was arsons there was stabbings um there was some very serious criminality um that was connected to it at that sealed its uh, place in, um, I suppose, the collective cultural memory of the time and make, makes it something fascinating, makes it something um, alluring, makes it sexy, makes it dangerous, gives it that element um, of all of those things that, it, that still prevails today, that still draws people in. And that, I suppose, is our innate desire and will to want to um, attempt to connect with something of the other, I suppose, uh, the occult or whatever you want to say or the dark side of life and black metal um, just happened to be a shade within that overall um, monochromatic colour scheme I suppose you want to say something like this without sounding ridiculous and I'm quite proud that my uh, my views on it haven't changed in 30 years black metal 1993 the class of 1993 I give it to you my friends over and out planet Satan <laughs>